This is a long one, but was so bizarre I think it's worth telling. I wanted to post it because this person recently tried to friend my now husband on Facebook and it brought back crazy memories and I need to vent it out. I got married right at 18 years old. I was a pretty book smart kid, but lacked street smarts. By the time I turned 20 years old, my now ex-husband and I had moved into a rental property in a pretty nice suburb outside of Chicago. In the basement of the house was a big mother-in-law suite where a good male friend of ours, Nick, lived as well. I was about halfway through nursing school at this time. This particular semester of nursing school, I had a very early clinical rotation once a week. I was 21 at this time. I'm not a morning person at all, so in order to maximize the amount of time I spent to sleep, I started loading all my stuff into my car the night before. Bags, books, and even my purse. Again, street smarts lacking. One particular night before clinicals, I asked my ex-husband Bobby to get a book for my car. Bob does, but forgets to lock the door. The next morning when I got to my car, I note that my purse is now gone. I ended up filing a police report. I was most concerned because I just got in this new job at nurse's aid at a hospital and I had my social security card still sitting in my wallet. Strike three for street smarts. Almost immediately after the theft, strange things start to happen. We started getting ding-dong ditches all hours of the day and night. Someone vandalized mine, Nick's, and Bob's cars with strange graffiti, swastikas, hangmen, etc. Egged our house, slashed Nick's tires. We first chalked it up to the neighbor's pranksters, but when we started having damages that cost some decent money, we ended up calling the police. Not to mention, one day when Bob was mowing the lawn, he noticed piles of cigarette butts outside the bedroom window. The police came out, pretty much did nothing but take a report, and told us to perhaps invest in car alarms and some brighter floodlights for the driveway. A few weeks after this, at 2.30 in the morning, I got a call on my cell phone. It was the police in the neighboring town. They picked up someone who had my ID on him, someone named Craig J. When they asked why he had someone else's ID on him, he claimed that I was his girlfriend. The cop called me because my name had popped that I filed a police report for theft. I assured the cops I'd never heard of him before and was told that I could pick up my ID at the police station within the next few days. Things really started to escalate at this point, but I still didn't make the connection that perhaps these incidents were related. I started getting strange messages on MySpace. This was in 2009, as well as on Facebook, from clearly fake accounts, with long-winded messages that made no sense. The person started messaging friends of mine as well. I deleted MySpace and blocked the person on Facebook, but new accounts kept getting created. Somehow, this person got my email address and started sending emails as well. I had no idea who this person could be, but they seemed to know details about me that indicated that this was either someone that I knew or knew someone I knew. The messages were overtly threatening, but creepy enough to where I started becoming uncomfortable. One night, my friend Lauren and I were sitting on the couch watching TV. Bob, Lauren's husband, and a few other friends had gone out for the night. As we're sitting around just chilling, we hear something that sounds like someone shaking the garage door. It was an attached garage. I go and check the garage. Nothing seems out of the ordinary. We had occasional issues with raccoons, so I chalked it up to just that. However, the noise just keeps on continuing. Lauren and I are getting freaked out at this point. Now understand the layout of the house. It was a modern style ranch house with no upstairs. The garage sounds moved now to the kitchen window, a distinct sound of someone's knocking or scratching hard on the windows. We call our husbands, who did not answer. At this point we debate calling the police. What if it is an animal, or tree branches? We don't want to seem stupid. As we debate, I see Lauren's face go sheet white and look past me. I spun around, and I can see the locked, fortunately, handle to the front door wiggling. We were seated near the kitchen. We now jump up. Lauren grabs a knife from the butcher block on the counter. I grab a small hammer from the junk drawer. We book it to the back of the house where the bedrooms are, cell phone in hand, and lock ourselves in one of the bedrooms and call the police. The dispatcher tells us to stay on the line, move furniture in front of the door if possible, and the police are now on the way. 
we shove a dresser in front of the door, knife and hammer in hand. We agree that this guy was going to come in. He might be bigger or stronger than us, but he's not going down without a fight. We plan that if he gets in before the cops, I go for the head with a hammer, she goes for the gut with a knife. Cops show up, banging on the front door, shouting, Police! We can see the red and blue lights through the window. We now leave the room, or let the cops in. They find no signs of anyone present or evidence of an attempted break-in. They do take a report. In the meanwhile, our husbands finally call us back. They come home, and the cops leave. Flash forward a few months. A very close friend of ours, Sean, was renovating his apartment and needed a place to crash along with his girlfriend. Bob and I decided he could stay in the third bedroom in our house. The first night Sean stays with us, we are awoken at 2 in the morning by Sean screaming at someone. Bob and I jump out of bed and rush into the hall, into Sean's room. Sean and his girl are wide awake, the lights on, looking totally freaked out. The screen is sliced and flopping in the wind. Sean told us he woke up to someone using what he thought was a knife on the screen and started climbing in through the window. We call the cops. They come out and take a statement. Sean describes the guy as best he could. A white male, young looking, semi-shaved head with what looked like darker hair. Cops, dust for fingerprints, comes back as a match for Craig J. Turns out I knew who he was, but vaguely. He was a year younger than me and we had gone to the same high school, but I couldn't remember having any significant interactions with him. He lived with his parents only a few blocks from my parents' house. I ended up reaching out to high school acquaintances who knew him and they remembered him as nice, but odd of a kid, kind of quiet, but definitely on the strange side, who had dropped out of school before graduation. Upon realizing that Sean had just moved in, the cops make a statement that chilled us all. He probably didn't realize that anybody was staying in this bedroom and thought the room would be empty. Cops go there, arrest him. He suddenly has quite this story for them. Him and I were secret lovers. I was ignoring him. We had a relationship. He had also been allowed into my home many times. I'm obviously floored. He gets charged with something like trespassing or breaking and entering and does a light time for it, maybe a month, and has to pay a fine. In the meanwhile, I got a restraining order on him, but he gets out and I hear nothing from him. I also ended up developing a completely irrational fear of first floor windows. Around Christmas of 2010, I am now 23 years old. I figure the whole Craig thing is in the past. Bob and I decide to divorce, unrelated to this, and go our separate ways, and Nick has long since moved out. We ended the lease. I moved to a less desirable suburb, but with affordable rent. I settle on an apartment in a four unit building that had a locked entrance, and the only way in was with a key or with someone opening the door from the inside. I lived on the second floor. By this time I'd graduated and was now a nurse, and was working now at a nursing home. Spring slash summer of 2011, it started up again, with calls coming through to me at work, only to have someone hang up. A letter suddenly appeared in the staff-only mailbox, mailed to me with no return address. The strange email started up again from random accounts. The messages were never overly threatening, but they were long, way too frequent, way too out there. He spoke to me as if we were long-lost friends and had some sort of connection. I don't think he ever threatened to hurt me, although the cutting into the house with a knife? Well, I don't know what was going on through his mind. What I kind of seemed to piece together over the years from his rambling is that he had some sort of crush on me when I was younger, although I never remember even speaking to him during high school, and him happening to rob my car was some sort of sign from the universe, or something that we were meant to be together. I call the cops. They basically tell me that because there have been no threats, and other than an OOP or a cease and desist, there's not much they can do except watch and wait. This goes on for a while. And finally, one night, I wake up at 2 in the morning to the doorbell ringing. I'm instantly in a panic. I look out the window. There, illuminated in the floodlight, is Craig. I burst out crying in my half-awake state, and I run across the hall and start banging on my neighbor's door. He was an older divorce guy who lived alone. He goes downstairs, confronts Craig, and tells him the cops have been called, and I actually call the cops. He takes off. I file a report. They claim they would talk to him, but this only makes things worse. 
Friends I have on Facebook now starting getting random messages from Craig, asking about me, telling them he has important information for me. Other times the alternates just saying that I owe him money and I have a debt I need to pay off. My friends block him as he goes along. Meanwhile, my younger sister is living in the city with a few friends. He somehow finds out where she lives and drives to her apartment and confronts her while she has people over. She freaks out. They kick him out and she calls the cops, who basically again state that he didn't commit a crime but offer her a restraining order. Right after this, another incident. My younger cousin is a high school senior on the cross country team. He shows up at my cousin's practice. Cousin has no clue who he is. He starts demanding information on me. Coach gets involved. Craig gets into a fight with the coach. The cops are called. He's banned from the school grounds, but nothing more. He calls the nursing home administrator at my job, asking him to talk to me and that he has important information to tell me. The administrator, my work was now aware of the situation, tells him not to come onto the property or he will have him arrested for trespassing. At this point, I'm paranoid beyond measure. Then, just as quickly as it started, it faded off. It's now summer of 2012, and the final crapper in the saga, I'm almost 25 now. A friend of mine named Stacy, and incidentally Sean's ex, moved in with me temporarily while she looked for a place. She was dating a new guy and spent quite a few nights at his place. One day, I picked up a double shift starting at 7am and ending at 11.30pm. Stacy texts me around 3.30pm stating she won't be home that night and was going out with her guy. I arrive home at almost midnight. First thing I notice is the door is unlocked. Uneasy, but thinking perhaps Stacy had just forgotten to lock it, I cautiously peer inside. I pan my gaze to the kitchen and living room. I just can't shake the feeling that I'm unsettled. Something just wasn't sitting right. Due to all these incidents, I always made sure that one of two lights were on, even when we weren't home. I was still not even fully in the door when I noticed that I was staring into a pitch black apartment, and immediately my brain went into a full panic, and I'm glad it did. Realistically, Stacy could have forgotten to leave a light on. However, my instincts were now in overdrive, and sounding off five alarm fire alarm bells. My Puerto Rican neighbor who lived in one of the building units was known for his weekend parties, and I could hear a party going on downstairs. I book it down the stairs and bust into the party, and I tell him what happened. He looks at me like I'm crazy, but agrees to come upstairs with me. We get inside. He looks around, and we see nobody. I'm starting to wonder if I'm just nuts. Maybe Stacy had her boyfriend over and they left in a hurry, forgetting to turn on the low lights and lock the doors. He agrees with me, and sort of jokingly pulls open the pantry door. What I saw next will never, ever leave my mind. There crouched inside is Craig. Puerto Rican neighbor puts the guy into a chokehold and I proceed to call the police. To this day I have no idea what he planned on doing. Cops come out and he's arrested. Because my neighbor was having a party, he had the door open to the alleyway. Chances are he just walked into the building and if anyone even noticed, people would just assume he was there for the party or whatever. It's more confusing how we got into the apartment itself. My theory is, my roommate at the time was from the country. While I lived in a suburb, it was the type of suburb right on the edge of a major US city. So we always locked our doors and generally kept everything secured as a rule. She was used to leaving her doors unlocked and wide open. And I think honestly it may have just slipped her mind when she went out to the door for the night. I confronted her about it and she of course denied it. But that's really the only logical way he could have gotten in. I always locked both the knob lock and the deadbolt whenever I left the house. Unless he was a skilled locksmith. I have no idea how he could have gotten in. I didn't stay alone or go anywhere by myself for a long time after that. I feel that I actually developed a paranoia because of all of this and was highly suspicious of giving my number or any information out to anyone. He ended up being charged and convinced of aggravated stalking, breaking and entering, and some other charges as well. I did meet his parents in court, who were both shockingly very normal, apologetic people. They tried explaining their son and claimed that he was mentally ill and suffered from bipolar disorder. When he's medicated, he's okay. When he's off his medications, he's nuts. 
After he served time, I did not hear from him for years, until 2016, when he found me on Facebook. I was much older now, now around 29 years old. I replied to him very firmly that any contact would end in the police being called, and that I had no interest in him at all. I blocked him in any way I could. Recently, he found my new husband on Facebook and friended him. He blocked him as well. To this day, I still have a paranoia. I had parked my car near a baseball diamond once, and some kids most likely hit a baseball into my windshield and took off, because I had a perfectly baseball-sized spider crack on the glass. Despite it being completely logical that it most likely was a ball, I instantly reverted to, Oh God, is he back? I honestly have no idea what happened to him. I also am now a total psycho about keeping things locked. Twice my life got screwed up because doors weren't locked my car door, and most likely my apartment door. I have an acquaintance monitor him on Facebook, his page is not private, and from what I've seen, he appears to go through periods where he's pretty inactive, and then episodes where he's rambling, over-posting, over-sharing, and acting generally deranged. I believe his parents were telling the truth when they stated that when he's medicated, he is okay. Part of me feels pretty bad for him. I am now older, and I have been a nurse now for almost 10 years, some of which time was spent in a psych specialty. The mind is a hell of a thing. Looking back though, those were some of the worst years in my adult life. It put me through a lot of anxiety and caused a lot of issues for me. I slept with my couch pushed against my apartment door for the next two years before I moved out of there. I am now married, but on the nights where I am home alone. I still find myself resisting the urge to stack furniture at the front of the doors. One of the other fallouts from this situation, Craig either sold, lost, or gave away my social security card that had been in my purse. Someone tried to file for Medicaid benefits in Arizona using my name and social, as well as obtained a job using my social and failed to pay any taxes, leaving me with a surprise asset freeze by the IRS and a whole financial mess that needed to be untangled before they unfroze my accounts and paid me back the money they started to pull out from my paychecks for the back taxes I had nothing to do with. My credit got extremely messed up for years because of it. And to this day, I have a lock on my social security number and monitor my accounts like a hawk. Moral of the story, never leave your purse in the car and always lock your doors. TLDR Stranger becomes infatuated with me for unknown reasons after stealing my purse, proceeds to stalk me and my family members for almost a decade, stolen social security card and purse gets used and IRS tries to claim back taxes as well as credit is messed up for years. Edit. Wow, this took off. Thanks all of you for helpful and kind responses. My inbox and the comments are flooded with a lot of similar questions, so let me answer from here. 1. A lot of you ask why did I not get a dog. I didn't do this because I live in an area where 95% of it is apartments in any sort of decent neighborhood at least do not allow animals over 25 pounds. Also I was working a ton of hours and when I wasn't working, being a young 20 something year old, I was out a lot. I didn't want to lock a poor animal up for 16 plus hours sometimes at a time alone for the sake of the dog and my neighbors. I did slash do have a gun, along with an FOID card and CC. I also had and have a taser and pepper spray, as well as a vehicle and home security system. I'm not blaming the police for this. While some cops were downright unhelpful, others were great. Cops cannot enforce laws, however, that don't exist, and stalking laws in this country are very much in the gray. Half of the incidents I could not prove beyond reasonable doubt were actually him. So prosecution was not possible until he violated his restraining order without a doubt it was him showing in my place and breaking into my house. For anyone who's dealing with a stalker and strange occurrences, involve law enforcement. It infuriates me to see that people don't call the police or don't tell anyone until later on. No, call them. They may not be able to help right away or you may feel stupid, but you need that paper trail. Over time, stalkers get desperate and stupid and they will try something extreme, and when they do, you need that evidence. You can save your own life, or the life of someone else, if they then try with another person. Hey everyone, 
I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. If you haven't already done so, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it so you can be notified of any and all future scary stories narration videos coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. I'm sure you're going to enjoy your stay. Now, let's continue on with these scary stories. It's been ages since I hopped on Reddit, but here I am to bring a story to all of you that happened not too long ago, and while it happened to me, it didn't start with me, but my mother, though somehow I became the focus of it. A couple of weeks ago, my mom was coming back from the store at around 10pm, got herself a pack of cigarettes and was hanging out with a friend of hers as she did so. On their way back, they came across Jeremy. It was a guy that they have both, and even I have seen a couple of times. Nothing major, just an acquaintance we all barely spoke to, though he was either high as hell this time around, or drunk, or both, I don't know. I do know this wasn't how he usually acts. Jeremy was angry over something, and came up to them and started screaming about wanting to forcefully have his way with them, and pulled his penis out, in public. After both my mom and her friend tried to just walk out of the situation, he started attacking my mom. Both my mom and her friend started fighting back, and they managed to get him to stop and made their way back to her house, where I currently am at, unaware of what the hell is going on. However, note that I said, stop, not leave. He lived in the same building as I do, and was following them from a distance away. So they both made their way upstairs. When my mom realized she had left her key inside, Nothing new. She is pretty forgetful, and I'm generally here to open the door when she does. Problem being, Jeremy made his way upstairs too, past where his floor is, and to ours, and he tried to fight her again. This is where I get involved. I grabbed a knife and threatened him to get out, which he did. I have no idea how he managed to get this impression, but he seemed to think I was trying to fight him, because after we made sure to slam the door the moment he exited and locked it, he started screaming at the top of his lungs about how we were chicken and to call the police, claiming he knows the landlord and can get him to delete any footage caught from the outside of the building and the hallways inside the building. My mom, being a quick thinker, started recording him from the door as he banged and kicked the door, trying to open it. Eventually he left when he heard we actually were calling the cops. He would think that this would be over, right? Well, it keeps going. After a couple of minutes, he returns to the door with a knife and starts stabbing our door while screaming and insulting us at the top of his lungs. He said he was going to kill the cops too. The police can clearly hear him on the phone. I think that's why they came this time around since I mentioned in my last Reddit post these guys are absolutely useless. The doors in this building are strong stuff. Metal, I think. I don't know. But while he made some light holes and scratches, he couldn't really do too much to it. So he shouts he'll be downstairs waiting for the cops, which we of course inform the cops currently on the phone of, and like perfect timing, while he makes his exit, they make their entrance, both using different elevators. There are two. Four officers knocked on our door and we opened up and told them what was going on and what happened from start to finish. While my mom showed the cops the footage she recorded, I was taking pictures of the damages to the door. The cops, clearly not wanting to be here, said to come downstairs with them. So me and my mom did, to which we heard screaming from the first floor. We are on the fifth floor, and heard him perfectly. Though, his screaming stopped real quick when four cops showed up. Instantly went, oh shit, and played nice with the cops. The cops were not having any of it, and arrested Jeremy right there and then. His friends were there, asking what did he do and screaming and shouting at the cops, before eventually running off. Jeremy was then taken away. I sent the damages of the door to lawyers, and do you want to know what happened about it? Silence. So this is where the story ends, right? Nope. Jeremy got off with a restraining order. However, since he lived in the same building as us, we couldn't stop him from simply being in the building. He was only not allowed to talk to us or cause any issues. This did not last long. On my way to the store, maybe two weeks later, he and his friends were all outside the building in a group, chatting and drinking. When I walked out, Jeremy instantly switched up the topic, saying, You see that kid? I'm gonna mess him up. 
he got the cops on me. Screw the restraining order. I wanted to get away from that as soon as possible, but I'd already left the building and would need to get close to the group I just finished taking my first couple of steps away from in order to get back inside. So I quickly made my way to the store, since I would be in public with people present. I end up just getting everything I need to from the store while trying to call my mom to tell her what happened. She didn't answer. Great. And here's where I admit I was a little bit dumb. I should have instantly called the cops, but I didn't. I didn't remember what Jeremy was wearing, and I'm honestly a wreck with anxiety. I wanted to first see if the group was still there before I attempted to make a phone call. They weren't, and I quickly made my way upstairs to inform my mom, who calmed me down and got me to call the police. The same exact police as last time showed up, and thank God for that, since they were well aware of Jeremy being a nutcase from the last time. However, this time we had no proof, other than what just ended up being a he said, she said scenario. So they had to sit in the hallway while they called their boss to make sure the arrest would be okay, due to the previous history and restraining order. All the while, Jeremy was in the staircase, laughing, and being extremely loud with his friends, and his sister, from what I later learned. Eventually, the police got an okay from their boss, and we all made our way to the staircase. I tried to stay as out of sight as possible as they once again arrested him. Jeremy claimed to be unaware of what he was being arrested for, and his friends left once again. His sister, who was in her mid-twenties from what I could guess, was screaming though, insulting them and saying he was being arrested for no reason whatsoever. Jeremy was hauled away again, and I have no idea what happened. No calls from attorneys or the police. No nothing. However, I ended up seeing him within the week, straying from eye contact with me or my family. He usually walks away the moment he sees us. I just wish that more came out of this, but I'm happy we're being left alone all the same. Though, he is always pissed off at seeing me. Alright, so this is something that I've been wanting to post here for a while, but I was sorta of too lazy to get a Reddit account. And when I did, I was too lazy to write it out. But alas, I'm stuck in a bus again with 40 minutes of time to kill and no music in my new phone. This happened to me this June. Our school exams start around June 20th every year. And well, I chose not to do math the entire year and study hardcore the last month. Our school is a private school that I can't afford without a scholarship. So I had to have good results on those exams. So, I got a tutor, who is also my best friend's mom. I spent almost every day at their place, which is on the other side of our small city. I live in Armenia, for context, and we're a poor second world country, so our public transport kinda sucks, and taxis expensive, minimum from our place to theirs is about 1000 drams, which is $2 but is more like 15 to us. So I have to take a crappy minibus for 40 minutes every time I got there and come back. Now, until then, my experience with public transports were pretty mild. I'm a girl, which I guess if you're not an ogre results in at least a small amount of unnecessary attention, but you get used to it after a while. Nothing too worrying. I got hit on once and twice and stared at a lot, but it doesn't really bother me. I get away most of the time because of my chronic bitch face. I look like the most unapproachable person on earth, let alone the bus or the station. So when this happened, I was beyond shook. That particular day I had to stay longer than usual. It was four days before the exam and I was extra panicky. Also I should note that I looked like absolute shit. My hair was greasy in a bun and I was wearing a huge hoodie and sweatpants. Not saying that it's a horrible look for everyone, but me in particular. I look like a potato sack with a head and an onion on said head as hair. So I got out at around 8.30pm and it was getting dark. When I got on the bus, it was full dark and the bus was entirely empty. Now to explain this property, you need to imagine the bus I was in and how the seats are positioned. This is what the bus looks like. I was sitting on the first seat next to the window, left one, and as I said I was the first passenger here. So two stops later. Three men got on the bus. This dude who had the full ability to sit anywhere he wanted sat right next to me. I didn't really give it much thought because, eh, it's the first row seat. Maybe he just sat where he could. 
The two other dudes sat in the front, next to the driver's seat. We drive for another two stops, and a girl gets on. He gets up to move seats, and the girl sits next to me. He started talking to her, and she seemed quite uncomfortable, although giggled along. On the next stop, he moved to the singular seat next to the right window. Now, this is where the first red flags come in. He turns to her side, full body, and continues talking to her like, Pretty girl, when are you getting off here? Maybe with me? And she's saying no and giggling uncomfortably. At this point, the driver himself is side-eyeing this dude. A stop later, she gets up to pay and he touches her thigh. She turns around and yells at him to stop. The driver turns around and calls him a son of a bitch, tells him to sit back and not move until he gets off his bus. Kudos to the driver, honestly. Stuff like this is common bus culture. Happened a couple of times to me and nobody ever said anything. Regardless, she practically jumps off the bus and speed walks away. My heart is racing at this point. I know it would have been noble of me to protect her, but I honestly couldn't. I was scared of the dude and I wouldn't have stopped him. It's 9.45 by now and the streets are emptying. I had my headphones in, but I turned the music off because, man, I'm scared of this dude and I'm alone with him with nobody else but an old man, the driver, and no one of the dudes from earlier who's fast asleep. That's when he turns to me. How old are you even? I didn't answer and pretend that I didn't hear him. He didn't ask again. I was facing away from him now, looking out the window. Instead, I felt the flash of his camera. I turned around and he was holding his phone at me. He was grinning and looking at me as if I was his friend whom I just pranked or something. I didn't say anything and continued to look out the window. At this point, I was full on panicking. I opened my bag as casually as I could and mentally screamed at myself. I left my pocket knife at my friends earlier that week and kept forgetting to take it back. So I took my pencil out, one of the mechanical ones with a metal nib, and quickly put it in my pocket. Then another flash came, this time with a camera click too. I literally dialed 911 and sat there. I didn't call it, just put the number just in case, and texted my friend. Then he was typing something. We got to my stop and I didn't ask for the bus to stop until we were right at it. The second it was about to pass my stop, I basically screamed to the driver to stop. He quickly stopped and I got off real fast. He didn't have enough time to get off after me as the driver drove off as soon as I left, probably because he had realized what was happening and didn't want him to follow me. I still don't understand why anyone would need a picture of me. I don't even want to, especially not then, like that. A couple of days later, when I was at the bus stop again, now heading from my place to my friend's place, I saw that guy again. He tried to talk to me, asked how old I was again. I promptly told him it's none of his business and proceeded to walk away. He tried to follow me, but I went into the local pet shop. I know the owner after six years of being their regular, and she told him more, uh, strongly to screw off. I never saw him again. I still don't get it, but I really, really never want to see that guy ever again. A few months ago, I, 22 years old, was at the local coin laundromat. I went late because I'd been studying, around 10 p.m. The laundromat is pretty small, closer to the edge of the beach town I live in. The town is pretty well known for the drifters and people experiencing homelessness. Most people are friendly, and there is a lot of drug use, but I've never really felt scared. Everything was fine until I went to move my laundry to a dryer. I was listening to music on my headphones, but not super loudly. Suddenly, I just got the feeling that someone was watching me. I can't really explain it. I just felt the presence. I turned around and there was a man standing just a few feet away from me. He was a white guy with pink hair wearing a full face mask, like a ski mask, a hoodie, gloves, and sunglasses, even though it was dark out. The gloves and sunglasses especially immediately made me feel uncomfortable. I thought maybe he was a drifter or high, but I didn't want to be rude. I tried to laugh it off and told him he surprised me. He immediately started talking. A lot of it was disjointed and just didn't make any sense. He was talking about coming up from Brazil to bring his brother money to get a classic car. None of it made much sense, but he would ask me questions and wait for me to respond. 
so I just tried to play along. I still thought he was probably just high or something, but he was standing between me and the only door, and I started getting this gut feeling that he was blocking the door on purpose, not just accidentally as he talked to me. He was getting closer to me as he talked, and the feeling now got stronger. Logically, something was off, but mostly I just had this feeling in the pit of my stomach that I needed to leave and keep him talking until I could. I started to edge to the side, but he stayed in front of me and the feeling got more intense. I started to grip my keys in an attack position just in case. He talked more and then backed off a little bit. He took off his backpack, which was a child's unicorn backpack, and set it on a nearby dryer. I looked over to the door for just a second, and when I looked back he was pulling something I couldn't see out and holding it to the side, behind him where I couldn't see, but I did see what was in the backpack, duct tape. Instantly it was just like an alarm went off. There was no more worrying about being rude, no more second guessing myself that he was just off but harmless. It was like this cold numb dread just washed down over me. I almost felt calm, like I knew the next steps. I knew I had to do something. Time seemed to move in slow motion, and he turned back to me, not saying anything more, and took a step forward. I gripped my keys as tightly as possible and tried to mentally prepare to fight. I remember being afraid that I would move too slow or be too weak, like in a nightmare. But all of a sudden the door to the laundromat opened, and a woman walked in, barely even looking at us as she went to get her laundry. It was like a scene in a movie, a moment of intensity, just interrupted by something, and suddenly it's over. He just turned, got his bag, and left. I was so scared that I just stayed there a minute until I could get my laundry and just go home. I didn't report it. I never knew what to say, since nothing had actually happened. But when I think about it, I think the scariest thing is that he left as soon as somebody walked in. If he was just crazy, it wouldn't have mattered. I really think a stranger's laundry timer saved me from something terrible. I don't go to the laundromat anymore. I joined a laundry service. The extra cost is worth it to never go back. So to the man with the pink hair and the unicorn backpack, let's not meet again. This happened last night. My sister and I just got off a train stop and were walking to my sister's boyfriend's apartment, not far away, less than a mile. This was something that we regularly did. He lives in a downtown area where there are always people roaming, and it was only 8pm on Saturday night, so we felt like there was no need for concern. As we were passing an alley, I saw something from the corner of my eye. It was tall, a thin dude leaning against the alleyway, and with a white mask. He was in a dark blue work coverall. My stomach now dropped, but I didn't react. My sister, on the other hand, made direct eye contact with him and grabbed my arm, saying very loudly, There's somebody there. We now started to walk faster. There was barely any people on the street, which was unusual for this downtown area at this time, because it's just a couple of days after Halloween so he figured he just was dressed up, but it became very clear quickly that he had started to briskly follow us because we heard his footsteps behind us. When we looked back, we saw that he also has a weapon in his hand. It was dark, and I didn't want to stick around to find out exactly what it was. My sister and I booked it. Neither of us run, but in that moment adrenaline kicked in and we're practically sprinting. We kept running until we saw a security guard who asked us why we were even running to begin with. When we told him he seemed skeptical and said he would check it out and send out a call if he found something suspicious. My sister and I thought we lost sight of him and so we decided to cross the street to a restaurant that had tables outside where people were sitting. It was well lit and busy so we honestly felt safe. But then we saw him walking down the same street, stopping and watching us. We went inside and told the waiter that we were being followed and that we were going to stay here and call the police. That's when he walked back a more deserted direction on the opposite side of the street. My sister and I decided to Uber to her boyfriend's place and call the police from there. Honestly, whether it was a sick Halloween joke or not, I'm glad I didn't find out.
I really wish I didn't have to write this down, but I don't think I'll be getting much sleep tonight anyway, so I figured I might share with you what's going on in my house right now. A couple of points relevant to the story. I'm a student who is currently pursuing his higher education abroad. The country I reside in is the Netherlands. I live with two other people whose rooms are on the same floor as mine. One flatmate in particular is slightly problematic. More on that later. I cannot possibly go out because there is a curfew in place, and if I go out I risk facing a fine. I live on the third floor, and the living room is located on the second floor. I work from home, and so I took a break from work to go and wash my plate in the kitchen. I usually eat in my room because I want to be close to my laptop, just in case something at work happens. This kitchen is located right next to the living room, on the second floor, and in order to get there, I need to go downstairs and move through the living room. Please keep in mind that it's 11pm here in the Netherlands, so it's pretty dark outside. So I go down and I turn on the lights in the kitchen without turning the lights in the living room on. I am already pretty familiar with the route to the kitchen, despite the darkness, as I have been living here for approximately a year and a half now. I washed my plate, and right as I'm about to leave the kitchen and turn off the lights, I see a silhouette getting up from the couch and then lying down again. This is the moment when my heart sank, and when I started wondering if I'm seeing things. I honestly wasn't brave enough to check and see what's going on, so I lowered my body down and really quietly went upstairs. I was literally crawling on the stairs at one point, so I finally reached my floor and then I knocked on one of my flatmate's rooms. I respect his privacy, and so I will not share any details about his appearance, but for the sake of clarity, I am going to refer to him as Kevin from now on. Now Kevin is a fascinating individual to say the least. He has three kids from multiple women, and according to him, there is a fourth one on the way. He is generally nice, but he tends to get crazy drunk, and some of the parties he throws at our place tend to be incredibly loud and unpleasant for the rest of the tenants. After our landlord warned him, he no longer seems to invite people over, thank god for that, but he still gets drunk pretty frequently, and it's usually a mess. I'm not going to share more stories, but based on my experiences, I assume that if there's anyone that knows what the hell is going on downstairs, it was going to be him. So Kevin opens the door, and I ask him if he knows anything about the person sleeping on the couch in the living room. I have calmed down a bit since. At first I reach the conclusion that this is one of Kevin's friends, who simply crashed at her couch. No big deal. But I wanted to make sure just in case. It turns out I was only halfway there. This person is in fact here because of Kevin, but they're not a friend of Kevin. They're a homeless person that were found by Kevin on his way home today. They have never met each other before. But Kevin felt bad for him and offered them to sleep on the couch at our place for the night. I was speechless to say the least. It's not that I don't mind having people over now and then, and I have nothing against homeless people, but I think that inviting a complete stranger over to spend the night at your place without at least discussing this with your flatmates is somewhat inconsiderate, to say the least. Moreover, there's a pandemic raging on worldwide, so this whole situation isn't exactly in our best interest either. I did consider going to a friend's place and spending the night there, but I'm not really interested in going downstairs for the time being, plus I risk getting a fine as going out after 9pm is prohibited here. So yeah, here we are now. I apologize for any grammatical errors, but English is not my native tongue, plus I don't really feel like spell checking this at the moment. It's relatively quiet now, and let's just hope it's going to stay that way. TLDR I went downstairs to wash my plate. Once I was done, I saw a silhouette on the couch in my living room. I shat my pants, quietly went upstairs, asked one of my flatmates if they know what's going on, and it turns out the silhouette is an unknown homeless person who is sleeping on her couch for the night. I had completely forgotten about this story until I started reading this reddit, so thanks I guess. But here goes. When I was in grade 7, I was 13, maybe 14, I had a short walk to and from school. I stayed late one day for school sport practice. I don't remember specifically because I was on every sports team, 
So I ended up walking home alone on this particular day. I started on my regular route and I crossed a street and was now walking maybe 25 feet behind a guy who was in a long black trench coat carrying a basket. No big deal. So I kept walking. But then the guy starts looking back at me every 20 seconds or so. Being a 13 year old girl, I was taught to be scared of pretty much any unknown man. So naturally I start to slow my pace. So I'm further back from him. He continues to look back at me. I continue to slow down and start debating turning around and going a different way when all of a sudden he turns around and pulls what looks like a machete out of his basket and just holds it out to the side, almost like a warning. I stop in my tracks and start walking backwards. He then turned back around and I booked it as fast as I could back the other way and took the long way home. I honestly have no idea if the machete was even real, but as a 13 year old, I was definitely scared shitless. This happened to me not too long ago. In fact, it's still long going, and I'll post updates when this happens more. But back in July of 2018, the last day of July, me and my group of friends started getting text messages from someone who was claiming they were going to murder us, and my friend who had a bird got a text saying they were going to shove his bird down his throat. We didn't know who this was. So we started looking. Oh, one of our friends, T, claimed I was the one doing this. Yet I don't have time to text someone at 3.30 in the morning and saying I'm going to come to their house and shove a bird down their throat and I don't have multiple numbers. So we started suspecting it was T, the guy who was trying to blame it on other people. As the day went on, we got new messages, continually blocking the numbers they kept creating from a VOIP or a free number app such as Google Voice or Text Now, and we kept getting these text messages and we had no clue what to do with them. One of my friends, L, who was particularly younger than the rest of us, told his father, who told his mom, which was a massive mistake on his end, as you'll see later. The day after, my friend L went back to school, and we were creeped out at everything, but the texter took a picture of my friend at his school and sent it to me. I was creeped out and I was ready to call the police, which had already been done, but they said that apparently they couldn't do anything about it. Another time that day, I went to Burger King, and I got a photo taken of me and sent to my friend. We're all in the same basic area, so it makes sense that people would be running around. My friend L got a new phone number, and the creepy texter got his new number somehow. No one knew L's new number, only his parents who deleted every app from his phone, which was painful, as he was the person holding our friend group together. As the summer came to an end, the text messages did as well, temporarily. In October, we started getting these text messages again, and it was a bit more complicated this time. The person who was texting us was claiming to be named Hiru, and he started every sentence like this. Hey buddy, Hiru told me you were at the theme park. When my friend went to the theme park and it was still creepy, but the police who were called multiple times could not do anything, apparently, according to them. The text messages came back around December, with Hero wishing everyone a Merry Christmas, aka sending threats to our phone number. We were all creeped out, and in January Hero was now gone. There was once again, another person, this time going by Ralph. His sentences started with, Hey it's Ralph, wanna get coffee? I now knew it was either the guy from Review Tech USA's videos or someone who watches Review Tech USA and it elevated a ton in February. The Ralph guy somehow got my parents numbers and started texting them and the guy said, Hey it's Ralph, I'm outside your house and I heard a car park in my driveway. I banged the window so hard and he sped off. A coincidence? Maybe, but it could have not been. He's never said that he was at my house before unless it was the guy who wanted to kill me. Since that time, he's threatened to shoot up a school too. We called the emergency number. L's parents took his phone away completely for a few weeks, removed all his applications again, removed his iCloud, set screen time restrictions, everything. It was sad because he had just gotten the iPhone XR for his birthday. This was way out of hand. And he stopped for a while and then started screaming in my texts, Rock, lizard every five damn minutes. Either way, Ralph, let's not meet.
It finally started raining here, so I took my son out mushroom hunting over the weekend. It was later than we normally go, and the sun goes down much earlier, but we were taking a quick trail to the river and back in hopes to find turkey tails or chanterelles. We took a wrong turn and ended up going through a big field, which the trail would take us back around to the main trail into the river. As we walked toward the main trail, the last group of people had left, and it was just me and my son. We walked along, and out of a thicket side trail came this weird man. He had a dog with him that was alert at his side. He was staring at us as we walked closer towards him. And then he started waving at us. This really weird, slow wave. I was immediately uncomfortable and goosebumpy, but didn't want to be impolite. So I half-hearted waved back while staring back and telling my son to slow up a little bit. I didn't want to actually meet up at the junction. After a full minute of us dawdling, the guy slowly turned and began walking down the trail toward the main trail. I was wary walking. I didn't want to go too fast, and so we stopped to look at some plants. So the guy and the dog got further down this trail, which curved to the right and continued on two blocks to the junction. I was thinking, if this was a creepy let's not meet, this dude will be waiting around the corner. And sure enough, he was standing at the junction. Off to the left and toward the parking lot, and to the right, was a six trail into the river. Dude was just standing there, with his dog staring at us, not moving at all. Both my son and I were like, holy hell, what the hell's he doing? Let's keep Y to the right. We're also telling ourselves that he looks pretty old, and we could actually run faster than him, and just generally planning for freaky stuff just in case. He kept staring at us as we approached. I asked if he was okay and kept staring back. He was greasy haired, tiny round glasses, a blue windbreaker, played long shorts, about 50 years old. His dog was a small beagle mix. He didn't answer me at all, just kept staring. We turned to the right and walked about a block. I had my phone cam facing me so I could watch him over my shoulder and the only movement was him slowly shifting his direction to continue staring at us. I didn't say anything else to him, it was moderately unsettling his stare made more so by his lack of response, emotionless face, weird tiny glasses, slow wave at us like a zombie. He didn't leave because on our way back he was no longer standing on the main trail. So freaky forest zombie dude, for sure stay in the thickets, and let's not meet. TLDR, silent staring sociopath on the trail. Alright, this happened about two hours ago as I was leaving for work today. For context, I work until midnight at a hospital. I have to park in a lot that's sort of across the way from the hospital. It's near a very accessible public transport area. My coworker and I were walking out together. However, her ride picks her up at the hospital, so I walk the last stretch to my car myself. I noticed after we parted ways that at the crosswalk there are two men just hanging around. Not uncommon to see people hanging around outside, so I figured not a big deal. On the other side of the street is another crosswalk leading to the same place, so I figured I'd use that one to avoid them as they were looking right at me. I'm standing there waiting for the light to change, and I see one of the men start walking towards where I initially came from in a nonchalant way. So I got a little bit uneasy. I took off my hat and badge, as it had my name on it, to tuck it away into my bag. I also took out my car keys. I ended up crossing at the light while it was still green because I just wanted to get out of there and the road isn't too busy at this time of night anywho. I noticed he had his back towards me but I was still a little bit paranoid. To get to the lot there's a little ramp you have to walk down so I jogged the way to my car. I got my bag ready to just toss in when I got in. I got to my car. No one was behind me on the ramp but I locked my doors as soon as I was inside. I now took a moment to breathe then turned my lights on started my car, and backed out of the spot I was in. I turned to give one last glance toward the ramp to make extra sure. I also was a little bit worried because if he did follow me, even though I was in my car, I drive an old car which is extremely identifiable. When I had looked, I saw a shadow figure walking down the ramp. I was pulling out of the lot now. It's a big lot and has a roundabout so I was making my way towards it. I gave myself the benefit of the doubt though, because the ramp isn't well lit around the bend and it's dark outside. I've also been prone to hallucinating shadow people so 
I don't want to psych myself out, especially because my co-worker and I were talking about movies like Hereditary and Donnie Darko on shift. So once I got a little bit back from where I pulled out from, I slowed down to take another look. It was definitely a person walking down the ramp. I wanted to give myself another benefit of the doubt, as employees are known to park in this lot and loads of us get off shift at the same time, so I didn't want to jump to conclusions. As I'm exiting the roundabout, I gave it one last look and the man was stopped and staring in my direction. He wasn't moving. I got freaked out and so I started to drive off rather fast as I had my main concern of this guy knowing and seeing my very recognizable car. I hardly stopped at all on my way home, rushing to even get inside my flat in case somebody else was prowling about. I can't say for certain what this guy's intentions were. It's better to be safe than sorry, I guess. My anxiety has calmed down a bit. However, it's still on my mind and I thought I'd share how important it is to be vigilant, trust your gut, and be aware of your surroundings, and make a plan for yourself as well. Creepy man slash men at work, let's not meet again.